heard from you. Well, well a male, a male from CWR. Uh, uh, he feels that uh, uh, she has not uh, written him. But he continues to write her and he says of the, of the capture of the Georgia, uh, well, that's one good deed for the Niagara. And we hope she will do many more before the uh, cruise is, is up. Uh, and uh, uh, they do uh, pursue uh, soon another ship uh, with um, a less success, uh, a great deal of frustration. Uh, I, uh, this is the Stonewall. The Confederates uh, had the idea of building stone walls uh, of ironclad ships uh, that were uh, superior in many respects to the uh, wooden uh, ships that the Navy had at that time. They had first come into, uh, 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 <coughs> begun to be used at the time of the Crimean War, just immediately preceding uh, the, uh, the, war, the Civil War, the War of the Rebellion, as it is properly uh, called. And uh, uh, they, they pursue uh, a ship called the, the Stonewall. Uh, less successfully. They stalk her, um, a great deal of controversy, a great deal of dissatisfaction uh, uh, by uh, 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 William P. Gould and others. He says that, and this is off, off the coast of Spain, off Portugal. I went to Spain and I went to Portugal and I, I tried wherever I can to follow his footsteps and to see what he must have seen. And so I, he talks about going down the uh, river toward, uh, uh, in Galicia, towards uh, El Farol, uh, next to La Coruña. And uh, uh, he talks about the fortifications on the river. And I went down that river. And there those fortifications are to this very day uh, in, uh, in Spain. And he described many things in Spain, which some guides of ours said, oh no, that he's probably wrong about it. And then they checked, and they found out again that uh, he was right, that he had described it correctly at, uh, at that particular time. Well, they're looking for the, the stone wall, and he says, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's an ugly customer. Uh, he, he draws a sketch of her, uh, and uh, uh, which, is, which we've reproduced in the, uh, in the book, uh, and he said, uh, she's an ugly punk customer. Many people say that she can hit with her prow. Well, we do not think that she can come over this ship. And uh, they have another couple of other Union ships in the area. Uh, and uh, they continue to stalk the uh, Stonewall. And he says, uh, I hope that we will soon leave this port. This is in El Farol in Spain. Uh, so that we can try her spirit. Um, and uh, they pursue her down to uh, Portugal. And eventually they, they don't get her. The great, don't get her. The great concern is that if she can get out of Europe and comes back, come back to the United States, uh, so superior is the ship that she can uh, uh, cause great damage uh, to, uh, uh, to the United States. Uh, uh, to, uh, in cities like Washington and Philadelphia would be able to shell uh, the shore. She gets away from them, but the war is over uh, by the time that uh, uh, she does. Uh, and uh, here is what he says. The day, not that the war was over this day, but the, the day that Lee surrenders. He's still in Spain, in Cadiz, Spain. And he said, on my return on board, I heard the glad tidings that the stars and stripes had been planted over the capital of the defeated Confederacy by the invincible Grant. While we honor the living soldiers who have done so much, we must not forget to whisper for fear of disturbing the glorious sleep of the many who have fallen, martyrs to the cause of right and equality. Martyrs to the cause of right and equality. It often speaks of the American flag to which we will will never give, with, which we will hold uh, dear to ourselves. We will never uh, honor any other flag but the American flag 
uh, and be loyal to her. Um, and uh, he says uh, 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 that uh, this flag is the flag of uh, right, the flag of, of equality. Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, remember that this war is being fought at a time when the United States has uh, the only republic in the, uh, industrialized, uh, in the industrialized world. Well, uh, then the war is still not over for them. They go to Britain and Ireland. They're looking for um, uh, other uh, uh, ships along the way. And finally, they return uh, to, um, to, to Massachusetts. And his ship uh, docks in uh, tr the Charleston State Naval Shipyard near Boston. Uh, and he uh, uh, says uh, on the day that he receives his discharge, having served three years, he, on September 29, 1865, he says, at the Navy Yard, Charleston, at 5 o'clock, I received my discharge, being three years and nine days in the service of Uncle Sam. Here he says, Uncle Sam. And glad I am to receive it. And I was paid $4.24. That was owed to me. So ends my service to the Navy of the United States of America. Well, here is where the diary ends on September 29, 1865, but uh, this is not where uh, the life of uh, William B. Gould uh, ends. Uh, he, uh, shortly thereafter, goes directly to Nantucket, where my great-grandmother has been taken uh, after her purchase from slavery. Uh, they uh, uh, marry, actually before he, uh, they marry, uh, he returns once more to Wilmington to take a look at how Wilmington uh, uh, looks, and uh, he expresses uh, some cautious optimism and, and uh, concern, but uh, is, uh, uh, is satisfied that the uh, slave auction is uh, no longer there, and that uh, while there are a great many difficulties for all, uh, the city looks to him much better than the way he, uh, he left it. He returns to Massachusetts, and uh, on November 22, 1865, he and my great-grandmother uh, um, um, uh, marry in the African Baptist Church uh, in uh, Nantucket, which we have uh, uh, which we've visited. Uh, the, um, uh, he, uh, they uh, uh, then go to uh, other portions of Massachusetts. Uh, they have. Uh, eight children, um, and uh, they settle from, in 1871 in uh, Denham, Massachusetts. He becomes the founder of the uh, local Episcopal Church uh, in, uh, uh, in Denham, and uh, he uh, uh, also becomes quite active in the Grand Army of the Republic uh, and serves as a commander of the, uh, this veteran, this important veterans lobbying unit in 1900 and 1901. And of course, most basic of all, he begins to uh, ply his trade as a, uh, uh, as a, uh, uh, a plasterer and a, uh, a brick mason. Um, he, of his, uh, he has uh, six sons, two daughters, uh, uh, those sons, uh, all served the United States, either in the case of my grandfather, William Beagle III, uh, William Beagle Jr., in, uh, in the Spanish-American War, and in the case of the others, uh, World War I, uh, many of them serving uh, in, uh, uh, in France. Um, uh, he uh, has a uh, very full life, uh, and uh, the uh, Dedham uh, newspapers uh, uh, record his his death uh, and uh, note the fact that and say uh, on May 26, 1923, uh, they say uh, East Devon mourns faithful soldier and always loyal citizen. A death came to uh, William B. Gould very suddenly. Um, 
veteran of the uh, uh, of the Civil War. Um, when I think of the uh, work that Wyndham B. Gould has uh, has done, um, I think of um, uh, some of the uh, things that he said uh, in the limited time that he had available to him, and the limited time that all of us have available to us. I think of uh, 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 some of the things that uh, he said when his ship was in uh, New York City uh, uh, in, uh, during uh, New Year's Eve, uh, 1863, prior to uh, going to, uh, to Europe. Uh, on uh, December 31, uh, New Year's Eve, he said, um, we called until 10 o'clock p.m on December 31, when we obliged, we were obliged to knock off on account of the storm. It uh, blew very hard from the southeast. The old year of 1863 went out furiously, as if it were angry with all the world, because it had finished the time allotted to it. Sooner or later, we must follow. So thank you very much for uh, uh, hearing me. Can I ask a question? Sure. I think I'll just have to do it. Hey, um, I'm going to pass around some uh, images for a second. Pass them that way. And maybe pass those back. I'll pass them on the window as well. We'll take some questions if you like. Um, I do want to mention. Yes, sir. Go ahead. On either of his return trips to Wilmington, do you know if there was any contact with the Bellamy family? Uh, no. Um, Did I already catch that? Okay, I'll, I'll read the letters. Sure. Was there any contact with the Bellamy family when he returned to Wilmington? The, there is a uh, uh, no. Is the answer. Uh, there is an essay uh, that he wrote about his return here, which is uh, which is uh, uh, yeah, toward the beginning of the book, uh, uh, and where I uh, have reproduced uh, essays that he wrote for a, a paper called The Anglo-African, uh, which was a paper of abolition, something that he took great interest in and wrote for and visited their offices in New York City when his ship docked there. Um, and he uh, described uh, how he uh, saw uh, the, um, how he saw Wilmington at that time. Uh, but um, uh, uh, no, there was no contact with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the Bellamy uh, family. He doesn't mention the Bellamy uh, family. He, uh, on page 81 of the book, uh, he has an essay called Items of Interest from, uh, uh, North, uh, from Wilmington, North Carolina. He says, uh, he said, we, we found the old store, old town, anything but what we left it. Her streets are entirely deserted. Her wharves that used to groan under a billion barrels of, um, uh, of, uh, slay, uh, of, uh, I've lost my page here. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, thousands of bales are, are entirely bare. Her stores are all closed with a few exceptions. Her workshops are silent. The river glides noiselessly by and not a ship there to break the current. The grass is growing unmolested in her streets. Yet with all this change for the worse, there is a still greater change for the better. You miss the auction block in Market Square where the traffic in human beings used to be carried on. Her traders' jails are turned into military guardhouses where any time you may see any number of the former lords of the soil taking a view of the passerby from a commanding position. The nine o'clock bell, too, is silent. And when you walk out at night, 
The demand for your pass is not made. And upon the whole, Wilmington is changed. And it goes on to uh, discuss uh, other things. Well, I take it he was about 25 when he escaped from Wilmington, roughly. Yes. Okay. Now, in a time when blacks were not allowed to learn how to read or write, where did he learn? Yeah. How to, where did he become black? Is this the wrong letter? Yeah. The question is, where did he learn to read and write? Yes. Yeah. We, we don't know the answer to that question. We have speculated. Uh, I think uh, Beverly has uh, discussed with me the idea that uh, that there were New England missionaries who were able to operate uh, in this area. His, his penmanship, if you look at his penmanship, which is reproduced in the book and which you can act, get by accessing the diary of the, in the Stanford Library, his penmanship um, uh, puts all of us to shame. Uh, <laughs> especially me, my wife is saying, especially me. Uh, it, it, his penmanship is excellent. Um, uh, so clearly he's trained by, at a time when North Carolina prohibited uh, blacks from being taught to read and write. Uh, clearly he is uh, taught by uh, uh, someone we don't know the answer to that question. He, but you see, he also has uh, uh, not only a, a great uh, knowledge of uh, things around him, he talks about, and I haven't gone into this in discussing this, uh, now, uh, events in the war elsewhere, uh, and uh, newspapers that he's read, but he has a he has an eloquence which uh, is not sh simply the product of uh, uh, of uh, not simply the product of uh, of uh, learning, but uh, really I think it's something truly God given. Now he lived. He lived uh, two blocks away from here with with the Gould family, or we really don't know uh, where where he lived. We assume that he was he was owned by uh, a man named Nicholas Nixon, uh, who lived out toward the uh, plantation, peanut plantation, out at Porter's Neck. Uh, during the war, uh, in December 1863. Uh, his ship, the USS Cambridge, comes close to the coast uh, into Rich Inlet. And he said, uh, have a good look at the place where I came from. And so I went out there. And I was uh, able to uh, look at Rich Inlet uh, from a vantage point uh, roughly comparable to the one that his ship uh, was. And it's right, he's looking right at the Nixon plantation. Well. Uh, with uh, Beverly's help, we pursued uh, Nicholas Nixon for a considerable period of time. Came up for the most part uh, empty in that uh, uh, in that pursuit. So many avenues opened and uh, then closed. Uh, the uh, uh, you know I was very excited about the fact when I saw on the the ship log. I got the ship log at the National Archives in Washington. Uh, and that's where all the owners are listed. Um, well, Nixon probably leased him out to uh, uh, to uh, this uh, operation, the building of this uh, of the mansion. But uh, and we assume during that period of time, immediately before the war, and perhaps at the time of his escape in Orange Street, that uh, he was living in this immediate area. But we don't know the answer to that question, yes, sir. Uh, I have a, all right, there's two questions. Um, one, did, so this, this is a fact check. I heard that one of his son, one of, one of the sons became like the first dean of one of the grad programs at Howard. Is that, is that a true statement? Uh, one, of, one of his sons became a professor at Howard Dental School. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the second question, do you know, does he speak of or write or talk about any relationship with him and Henry Taylor? No, no, here no I, I didn't know of uh, Henry Taylor until uh, I began to read about him uh, uh, and uh, in recent in recent years. Uh, I, it may well be that he uh, knew him. Uh, we, we, I think we have pretty well, uh, again, he, most of the people he's corresponding with, 
he uses their initials. I think we pretty well found out, uh, thanks to uh, the book that you co-authored uh, uh, probably uh, here uh, in the 90s, which, which featured the leading uh, Reconstruction uh, people who were, who were black, we pretty well found out who most of those people are that he's corresponding with. But so far as I know and can recollect, he was not uh, in touch with Mr. Taylor, uh, at, at least as reflected in the records. That's why I really love the, Does he talk or reflect on why he put his initials and in some of his plastering work around the building? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, 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 no, he, he didn't. I think that there are others that, other initials uh, of other workmen in the building, as I recollect. Uh, All the duels and things, yeah. Yeah, and so uh, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, he uh, took a great, uh, I suppose, if we can look at what he did when he went to Massachusetts, he took a great deal of pride in his work. Yeah. Um, I may not have this right, but is it true that the diary was not discovered until 1958? And were you the one who discovered it? No. Uh, it, it's true that the diary was not discovered until 1958. I, Sorry, let me repeat that. It's when the diary was discovered, was it discovered until 1958 or some other time? And, and was I the one who discovered it? Uh, no, I was not the one who discovered it. It was discovered in 1958 by my father. Uh, my, my father had a very close relationship with one of William B. Gould's sons, Lawrence Gould. Uh, they, uh, Lawrence Gould was the only one of the sons who took up the trade of plastering, a very difficult and uh, uh, particularly at this time, a physically taxing trade. My father described to me often how he uh, tried to work with Lawrence as a young man and uh, Lawrence in a household where no swear word had ever been heard, and, and where my father never said a swear word uh, throughout his life. He was wasn't a goody goody kind of guy, it was just a, that's just the way he was. He, Lawrence unleashed a card of swear words on my father for his dissatisfaction with the work that he did. But he must have liked, he must have liked the work, he must have liked uh, my father a great deal. My father, and he talked a lot together. And so when he died, he bequeathed his property to my father. And my father drove up there. We were living in New Jersey. We had moved from Massachusetts to New Jersey in 1940. And my father drove up there, and the workmen were already in the house throwing out things. And he went up to the attic, and he found uh, these volumes. Uh, 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 Fabulous. And where are the originals now? Uh, the original uh, of the diary was given by myself to uh, the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, I'm in, I did not give it to the Smithsonian because they would not promise to me that uh, they would always show it periodically. And uh, Massachusetts Historical Society did. And also, I felt that, uh, you know, um, my father and uh, my, I think my great-grandfather, loved Boston, and they loved Massachusetts, and they always wanted to return, my father always wanted to return there, so I felt this would, this would be the appropriate thing to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to do. My father speaks, used to speak to us, and he told us a number of things anecdotally, anecdotally about my great-grandfather, but and I, some of them are mentioned in the book. One which I always think about is that uh, one time, uh, uh, my father, uh, uh, my father was living next door to my great grandfather. His father was there. There were three William B. Goulds living in two households. He took the phone, and the guy, guy said on the phone, to Bill Gould, and he said, "Yes, speaking." He said, "The hell it is." And uh, it was one of these. Well, my father described one of these gruff uh, Union veterans who was uh, calling my great grandfather. Uh, 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 my my great grandfather got quite a reputation, a good reputation in uh, uh, Dedham because he did, uh, because of his honesty, he did things that uh, cost him dearly, uh, financially, and uh, the community knew it.
Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any sense of why they left at the bottom of Orange Street? Oh. Uh, why was the escape from the bottom of Orange Street? No. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Very succinct. <laughs> Uh, how did he come by being in um, Nant uh, Nantucket? How did we get to Nantucket? Oh. Yeah. How did he get to Nantucket? Oh, wow. Is this thing? Is that? What are we doing back there? <laughs> well, the the, uh, uh, the the Fugitive Slave Act uh, of 1857, and there were a number of Fugitive Slave Acts passed by the Congress, allowed uh, uh, owners of slaves to uh, uh, go to any state in the Union, this is sort of a logical extension of Dred Scott, and to retrieve uh, slaves that they had owned, whether they had escaped, whether they had been purchased, uh, they were the property of the owner. So uh, Nantucket became a favorite place for uh, blacks who were escaping from slavery. Uh, because of its remoteness. It's, a, it's part of Massachusetts, but it's an island off the mainland. It's, it's more difficult to get there, and it's more difficult to bring someone back. And uh, uh, a number of people uh, were living there under those circumstances at that time, and that's the reason why my great-grandfather was taken there, my great-grandmother was taken there, and that's why my great-grandfather went there to be with her, and, uh, uh, and they, they resided there together from 1865 through 1866, where my oldest great aunt, whom I knew as a child, uh, Medora, Dora, was, was born in, in their time. Yeah, one of the back, one of the back so. Do, Is there any knowledge as to the extent of planning prior to the escape that took place? and? Do we know the names of the other men who are with them? Yeah, we do know the names of the other men that uh, are with them, and they are in the book. Uh, um, and I, I try to, uh, you know, there are many avenues you pursue uh, when you do something like this. And over a number of years, you come up empty. One of the things I tried to do was to find, I tried to find many people's descendants. And uh, I thought maybe I had a breakthrough in, New, New, uh, in uh, uh, Newport, when he, because uh, he stops in Newport as his ship moves north to visit one of his friends who has escaped with him. Uh, very interesting thing that he wrote, he, he wrote about his escape in, in an essay called Interesting and Romantic Narrative. Now you may ask, why is it romantic? And uh, in, this, in this essay, he describes the fact that one of the men who escaped with him, who went to Newport, Virginia, ultimately, uh, was engaged to be married to a woman. When she found out uh, that he had uh, escaped, she said, I will try to escape. And uh, she dressed as a man. Uh, in a Confederate, she apparently was light-skinned and, and dressed as in a Confederate uni uniform and was able to gain access to the area in which his ship was uh, they were picked up by another ship and brought actually to the USS Cambridge. Of course, they wouldn't let her uh, stay there for long and she and her husband uh, uh, eventually settled in uh, uh, Newport, uh, uh, in Newport, Virginia. Uh, but, so we, we have the names of all of them, but uh, all except I think maybe one of them we, we uh, uh, don't have. But uh, we don't know too much about these people. We're trying to, uh, uh, some of their names, a couple of them went to Massachusetts. I thought that might be a breakthrough. I, I thought that Newport might be a breakthrough with one of these fellows in Newport, but, and I traced his descendants all the way up to the 1940s. But in the 1940s, the color bar was beginning to break down. And the telephone, I got them through the telephone records, 
And the, but the telephones used to be segregated, which showed who was colored, who was white. But they stopped that in the 40s. And with that, my research of this particular individual came to a stop. I couldn't, I couldn't find any more. Uh, I found a couple of them in Massachusetts, a couple of brothers, but I, I couldn't find much about them. Now, Matt, uh, so that, that really is the, uh, there's a, a lot of this is, uh, is uh, rather dry and uninteresting stuff. Really. <laughs> One other question is, are there any reports as to the attempts to recapture or to capture them and bring them back to Wilmington? No, uh, but I assumed, I always assumed, I don't know uh, uh, whether we had a discussion about this recently, Beverly, but uh, I always assumed that he uh, used their initials in correspondence, the initials of various people, so that if he himself was captured, nothing would be revealed at least immediately about them. Um, uh, you know, I assume that it, it became a great jigsaw puzzle to to uh, to figure out who he's corresponding with because he's only talking about he's only talking about them in terms of their initials. I, I have to assume that that was the case. They could have easily been uh, captured by the Confederates at some juncture. I was surprised to find out how much of North Carolina I didn't know this until I began this work was held by the United States in the early part of the war in particular. And uh, he keeps speaking about going to cities like Beaufort. And uh, uh, is it Beaufort or Buford? I've forgotten now. So in Beaufort, he talks about going to uh, uh, cities like Beaufort. And uh, I went up there and had lunch. Uh, just, I figured, very close to where his ship uh, pulled in. And uh, I tried to uh, follow him to a number of those uh, cities. He talks about Moorhead City. He talks about, you know, because they're moving up and down the coast there. And, uh... You, you mentioned a story about Gould on the Niagara seeking the Alabama, CSS Alabama, and they were a little bit late. But I wonder if there isn't yet another connection of Wilmington in that story, because Beverly, you probably know this more than I do, and and because there's a historical marker off the library, right, about Winslow, who was the captain of the Kearsarge, yes, captain yes. of the Alabama, and yes. the Manet picture, French Impressionist Manet's picture of the Kearsarge in the Alabama in the final battle. Well, the the uh, uh, of course the Manet's uh, uh, picture, which is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, appears. Uh, is reproduced in the uh, in the book where the uh, plaque, the marker uh, for Winslow, uh, was one of the first things I saw when I first came to uh, uh, to uh, Wilmington in 1989, and uh, I was very surprised that uh, he was uh, from uh, Wilmington. Uh, and by the way, uh, those who have compared the uh, dimensions of the Niagara to the Corsage. Uh, say that uh, uh, Corsage, that, that uh, the Alabama would have been easy pickings for uh, the Niagara. The Niagara was much more uh, formidable than the uh, Corsage. Anybody else have anything? Where does the name Gould come from if he was owned by Dixon? Oh, yeah. Dixon. Well, I, this is a great, this is a great mystery. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, you know, in the early stages, I think it was also 1989, one of the first things I did before I went to Wilmington uh, is, of course, I returned to uh, Massachusetts to uh, look at records there, to go back to the, the parish uh, the, that he helped to found, the Church of the Good Shepherd, in which I was baptized uh, as a child. And... Um, the, um, uh, the, the uh, you know, he, he got his death certificate at that point. And on the death certificate, uh, it said something that I had never heard, never been aware of. And that is, it said, place of mother, 
uh, birth of mother, no, Wilmington, North Carolina. Place of birth of father, England. Uh, so uh, back now, we, we've been on a long search for Alexander Gould. Um, you know, the search for his mother and her people became apparently very difficult here because her name is so common here, and her name is Moore. Uh, there's so many Moors, black and white. Um, uh, you know, we, we just, this is a story of just missing uh, so much, you know, had his mother lived a couple of more months until Wilmington was liberated in the spring of 1865. Um, she might have been in this book that the United States put together about the colored people in Wilmington. But she, because it told who they are, what is their age, what do they do, and her, she would have been there. But, uh, uh, you know, she died just two months before the Union troops uh, got here. William Beagle talks about that in his, uh, uh, in his diary. Um, so we looked a long time in, uh, for Alexander Gould, and uh, Beverly has been very helpful. And I think that uh, and my <coughs> oldest son, Bill, has been helpful, and uh, I think we're still looking. <laughs> <laughs> we're still looking. All right. I think we're good. And we're going to go. Well, that was fascinating. Thank you all again for coming. I'm going to give you one housekeeping piece here. If you'd like to buy a copy of the Iron Contraband, the way to do that today is the gift shop in the carriage house over here, because it has to register. And then if you would like to come back and get signed, uh, Dr. Bill will be here in the house. You can walk over there and walk over and get it signed. Um, we're actually going to give